Okay, I think we can make a start there. So uh, feel free to start in your own time. Okay, sounds good. Great. So yeah, my name is Daniel Schaefer. I'm a, I'm a scientist at the uh, University of Rochester Laboratory for Laser Energetics in the US. Um, and uh, outside of work, I, I, I try to make contributions to the Fortran Standard Library. And you know, you can sort of tell by the long author list here that this is, you know, this is far from just my work alone. You know, this author list is includes people who've made you know, some kind of substitution in the past year, but as we'll see, part of what's exciting about the Fortran Standard Library project, and which has especially uh, become even more true in this past year, is that um, it's, you know, it's more than just the names you see here. So it's a quite a large collection of people that are helping to work on this, uh, you know, really neat project. Okay. So before talking about what's new in the standard library. I think we just need to touch base and make sure we're all on the same page about what it is. So this is a volunteer effort uh, maintained under the Fortran Lang organization. The code is all hosted on GitHub at uh, you know, github.com, Fortran Lang, uh, Standlib. And so one aim of standard library project, there are several, but one of them is to serve as a testing ground for future intrinsics and to provide reference implementations. This is sort of, uh, sort of a, a community-based way for um, you know, Fortran users to be a sort of a go-between, you know, when their new intrinsics are proposed and to get access to them before they're implemented in compilers. Okay. That's one goal, but I'd say that's not the main goal. The main goal is at a high level to be bridging the gap between what's offered intrinsically in the language versus, you know, the kinds of high level code that you'd be like, you'd like to be writing in applications, right? So, you know, the scope is everywhere from general purpose programming, like what you'll find in like the C++ standard library or the Python or Java standard libraries, spanning all the way to having like a nice base of numerically oriented functionality, like what you get out of the box of MATLAB or what you get when you install uh, the, the Python scientific ecosystem, right? So this includes everything from, you know, string uh, handling, logging, file system interaction, searching, sorting, but also linear algebra, special functions, statistics, right? And so that's a really, really broad scope for a standard library. And so it's a tall order, but I think in the past year, we've made really good headway. So by raw count of the number of modules that are in the project, the standard library has roughly doubled in size in this past year, since, since last year's Fortran Con. So a year ago, that sort of looked more like a grab bag of utilities than a proper cohesive standard library. And, you know, we had ASCII tools, we had, you know, some simple quadrature rules implemented, some simple Linux and, you know, grab bag of utilities. But now, with, you know, in this past year, it's expanded to, I think, be much more deserving of its name with lots of exciting development, especially uh, in general purpose programming functionality like string handling, sorting, logging, and support for uh, bit sets. And so to show some of that off, I've got a couple uh, brief examples. Uh, written up here. So this first example is a demonstration of the standard logger module. So this is a module which defines a derived type for logging messages to a file. It's a simple and common need, um, but if you decide you need to have some kind of logging, you end up rolling it yourself now. So standard is now stepping in and saying, well, here's one that's ready-made and highly configurable. So it's got options to control, you know, which file or multiple files a logger should write to, how to format timestamps if you want timestamps, which types of messages you want to log, and lots more. I can't even begin to go into you know, the degree to which it's configurable uh, in, in just the space of one uh, demo. For very basic needs, like what's shown off here, it's good enough to use a predefined global logger instance, which is a, a module level variable that for many simple applications uh, gives you what you need with minimal uh, setup. So what we're doing in this example is connecting the global logger to a log file on disk, and logging a couple messages, a debug message, an info message, and an error message, right? And so what we look, if we look at the output, if you were to run this and look at the output of the log file, you see that the info and the error messages were printed, the debug message was not, which is showing that the global logger by default is configured uh, to only report messages, info, and higher. So you can set you know, the level of detail at which you want to the, the logger to, um, to output. And so, like I've said, this is really just scratching the surface of what you can do with the, the logging module. The design is really flexible, uh, flexible enough to set a pretty sophisticated logging infrastructure if you need more sophisticated logging infrastructure beyond the global logger. For instance, if you have a co-array application, you can configure separate loggers for each image or team of images. 
And the standard library now makes that much easier to set up than uh, you know, trying to roll this all yourself. So for our next example is a look at the BitSets module. So this provides a feature that is really frequently proposed for standardization. In fact, it nearly made it into the Fortran 2008 standard, but was sort of struck uh, late in the standardization process. And that is an abstract type for working with strings of bits. So you, know, you can do a lot of bitwise manipulation with integers already, but it's, it's not quite as portable as one might, one might like to have. And you always have to worry about bit order and these kinds of things. The standard bit sets module has a canonical representation of a bit string. So the, the basic type of bit set is, uses an internal representation, which is a 64-bit integer supporting uh, bit strings up to 64 bits. But it internally keeps track of how long your actual bit string is. So here I'm initializing two bit strings, one from a string and one from an array of logicals. And in the comments, we see what the sort of internal representation this is a, a representation of what like a literal bit string value would be. So for the purposes of derived type uh, IO, uh, this is what uh, you know, a, a read statement or a write statement would say your bit string uh, looks like. The prefix here, S6B means a set of six bits, right? And then the following digits are the actual zeros and ones of the bit string. So most operations with bit sets work in place rather than creating new instances. So for instance, all your usual Boolean algebra operations like the exclusive or are implemented as subroutines that overwrite the first argument. Uh, likewise, when you're setting or clearing single bits or contiguous ranges of bits, the data is modified without making a copy. And of course, this is just in line with the idea that if you're interested in using bit sets in the first place, you're probably being very memory conscious. And so we're implementing this functionality to be as parsimonious with memory as possible. And so for a third, um, uh, little demo, we'll have a look at the sorting module. So sorting is something, you know, it's one of these classic things that everyone who for programs in Fortran long enough has to write their own sorting module at some point and they tweak it as they go along. And this is like a perfect candidate for the standard library to just have a canonical sorting implementation that people can just use out of the box that works well and is, is well tested. So currently there are three sorting routines that are implemented. Two of them are called sort and or sort, which are for basic in-place sorting of arrays. And these have uh, different algorithmic trade-offs with respect to stability. Uh, and you know, if your array is par partially ordered already. The third, which is what's being shown here is sort index. And this is akin to what other languages or libraries would call arg sort. So in addition to performing the sort on an array, it also outputs an array of indices, uh, which give the permutation of, your original, of the original array that would put it into sorted order. Right? And so this is very useful uh, because you can then use this index array as a vector subscript to then permute other arrays in the same way that your original array was sorted. That's a very complicated way of saying something that's very commonly needed and is very intuitive when you actually realize that's what you need to do. And so all three of these sorting routines can also sort in descending order rather than ascending order. And they can also take a user supplied workspace array to avoid internal memory allocation. So if you decide that uh, you don't want to deal with the cost of allocating internal memory, you can provide that workspace for it optionally. So with lots of great new functionality in the standard library, um, and the part of the reason why we got that is in large part thanks to an influx of new contributors to the project in the, in the past year. So not only has the number of modules doubled, but so has roughly the number of people who've committed changes to the standard library and the number of people who've contributed in other ways via you know, uh, discussions and the issues or, uh, or uh, reviews of pull requests. And so this figure is just pulled from GitHub showing the commit history in the past year, showing nice you know, sustained uh, activity. And I think uh, you know, included in this, this uh, growth of contributors, also our two Google Summer of Code students who we'll be hearing about from after this talk, Aman Godara and, and Chetan Karwa. And so uh, it's been really great to get all these new contributors. And that's what really has led to the growth of Standard Lib. And it's, it's why the project is, continues to be exciting and continues to grow. And I think we'll see um, you know, great development going forward. So besides implementing and discussing new features, the other way in which Standard has improved a lot in the past year is sort of behind the scenes stuff with its infrastructure. In particular, it's now really straightforward to work with the standard library, whether you're a developer uh, or a user. So it has three dependencies if you're wanting to sort of build it yourself. Uh, the quote, hard way, which is not all that hard in practice. You need a reasonably modern Fortran compiler, 
support putting at least a 2008 standard, you need a reasonably recent version of CMake, or you can use the, uh, the plain make files. And you also need the, uh, the fifth preprocessor, which is the Python script, which we are using uh, basically as a, as a template engine to produce uh, generic routines. And so these are individually not that hard to install on most systems. Um, you know, you can just do it yourself um, using your own package manager or, or PIP or whatever, but you can also use Conda to get um, nice compatible versions of everything and have an isolated environment if you want to do go that way. So then once you get the source from GitHub, you can build standard library and run its test suite with either make or CMake. And then when you install the standard library, not only do you get a static or shared library, to link, but you also get a package config file and a CMake package file. So that if you use uh, uh, you know, a make-based build system for your own projects or a CMake-based build system for your own projects, you automatically, um, you know, you don't have to worry about resolving, you know, figuring out the, the paths and unnecessary flags and things to include standard library that's done for you. And of course, this is a lot more complicated than the ideal, right? This is not too bad, but it's still more complicated than the idea, which is just to distribute the standard library as an FPM package. And so when I started this talk, this was not yet supported. And within the past, what, a week or two, this is now supported, which is a really cool and exciting development. So let's just, let's just show that. So for a long time, uh, this was kind of difficult to handle um, because standard, the standard library's pre-processing needs pre-processing needs were difficult to accommodate uh, within FPM. And so the solution that's now up is to maintain a separate branch of the standard library project on GitHub, which contains the pre-process Fortran source, just the way FPM wants to see it. So now it's not only possible to build a standalone uh, standard library using FPM, but it's also trivial to include it as a dependency. So we'll hear more about uh, FPM in, in, the, in the final block of, of this uh, session, uh, but you know, FPM basically works through this uh, fpm.toml file. It's a configuration file. And with just a few lines in this toml file, you can, it will automatically uh, grab the appropriate branch of the standard library from GitHub and it just works in your projects. So now you have all of the functionality implemented in the standard library from here on out with just a few lines in, in an FPM config. It's, it just works, it's incredible. <laughs> I was so happy when I did this the first time and it, it just worked without any issues. So the standard library project is also leveraging GitHub's uh, continuous integration workflows to check its cross-platform support. So currently on every pull request, the CI builds the standard library and runs its test suite on seven different platforms, meaning seven different com combinations of compiler, OS, and CPU architecture, right? And so this is the table of what's tested at every single pull request. This doesn't, it is not a list of all the platforms that are the worst standard library will build. So as long as your compiler supports the 2008 standard or 2018 standard, standard lib should compile, right, without issue. There are some minor workarounds, there's some known workarounds that are needed for NAG and for some older GNU versions, but for the most part, uh, anything reasonably recent will just work. Anecdotally, I built standard library with several versions of iFort on a recent MacBook as well as several versions of G4Tran on a junky 10-year-old netbook running 32-bit Linux. So like, odds are, if you've got a reasonably modern machine and a reasonably modern compiler, you can build the standard library and you can use it in your own projects. All right. So I've used this talk mainly to highlight the cool new developments and accomplishments of the project so far. But as with any project that's ongoing, there's always room for improvement, right? So for one, I, you know, you can sort of tell by the demos that I selected that most of the big exciting new modules in the standard library serve general programming needs. And there are a couple of reasons that numerical functionality is a little bit slower to come in. One reason is that once you start discussing the API and possible imp implementations of, of numerical functions, you know, a lot of simple things turn out to have subtle difficulties that you really, really need to get right. So my first hand experience with this was you know, maybe several months ago, there was a discussion of a uh, possible key root function as sort of a first foray into, uh, you know, math library type uh, functions. And even if something as simple as a key root, you have to consider all kinds of floating point edge cases that you just wouldn't bother with in your own personal code, but is really critical to get right in something that builds itself as a standard library. And so these kinds of subtle things, um, you know, contribute to the slower adoption of numerical code. Another re issue is that, you know, many types of numerical algorithms really ought to be reviewed by people with particular domain knowledge to ensure that the implementation and the tests make sense. 
Uh, the prime example for this right now is a handful of pull requests um, for statistical distributions, you know, similar to what's a uh, functionality like what you have in R for calculating and sampling various distribution functions in statistics. And really, these deserve uh, a reviewer with appropriate background in statistics to, to vet them to make sure they make sense. And then uh, another uh, thing, which is not really an issue, but it's sort of something that we're an, an evolving thing that we're, we're trying to better understand is that when we're discussing new feature proposals in the standard library, a uh, recurring question is, should we be including this in the standard library or should this be an FPM package, something that stands alone? And really, and this is more testament to the progress made with FPM. But my point here is just that this is a boundary that's being mapped out and sort of the, the scope of standard library is an evolving thing. The other point that's a, a big area that we're trying to improve in the standard library is the documentation. So, uh, you know, any new feature has to come with documentation, uh, you know, when it's implemented, the style and the rigor of this documentation can vary quite a lot, right? And so the proposed solution right now is to establish a baseline template for all specifications to follow, which will hopefully give the standard lib documentation a more uniform feel, as well as be a helpful starting point for new contributors. And so finally, I'll close on some additions and improvements to look forward to in the next you know, six to 12 months, sort of near term goals that we hope to see um, implemented in the standard library. So some of the highlights being procedures for probability distributions, as I just mentioned, and sampling pseudorandom numbers from them. We wanna have derived types for generic collections being linked lists, which uh, Chetan will talk about in his lightning talk, as well as a generic map or dictionary type, as well as hash functions to go along with that. We also want to have cross-platform support for querying the operating system and manipulating the file system. You know, this includes things like listing and traversing directories, removing or copying files, things that historically have been provided by uh, compilers, but in a non-portable way, right? In the sense that uh, what works for one compiler uh, may need to be changed for other compilers. And so this roadmap is driven by the community and their contributions. And this list is largely based on the backlog of existing pull requests that are being reviewed and improved upon. And uh, I think the important message that I'd like to close here on is that if there's something that you would like to be a part of the standard library, you know, just let us know, open a proposal in the GitHub issues, right? We'll discuss it, we'll come up with an implementation plan. Right. And the worst thing uh, that could happen is people say, mm, maybe that's not a good idea for standard library, but don't let that stop you. You know, we want your ideas, we want your feedback, and it's always welcome. So just to summarize, the standard library is, is aiming to be a sort of a de facto standard library of general purpose and numerical facilities for Fortran. Uh, it's roughly doubled in size in the past year, both in terms of its uh, number of modules and in terms of the cont contributors to the project. And so some of the new exciting models include bit sets, logging, math utility, sorting, special functions, RNG, string handling, lots of great stuff that are fleshing out the standard library. And we've also made lots of great behind the scenes infrastructure and packaging improvements to make standard library easier to install and use for users and developers alike. And um, yeah, that's what I've got to say about it. Thanks for letting me speak about it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. It's uh, really exciting to see all of that progress uh, going on uh, in detail. So I think we'll uh, move straight on to um, a, a, a man's talk, um, a GSOC project talk on improving uh, string support in uh, Fortran. So a man, if you're here and you can share your screen. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So I'm, I'm here to screen. Can you see my screen as well? Yes, I can. Go, go ahead. Okay. So I'm here to communicate about strings in Fortran standard library. So here are some of the term terminologies that I'll use throughout the talk. When I say character sequence, I mean a sequence of characters, a feature that is intrinsic to Fortran. And when I say string, I mean an ins instance of type string type a uh, feature that is extrinsic to Fortran and provided in standard library. When I say string list, I mean an instance of type string list type, again, a feature that is extrinsic to Fortran and provided in standard library. For all the three, I have a small code snippet here. In the first line of each, I have defined a variable. And in the next line, I have assigned that variable a value that is written on the right-hand side of the assignment operator equal to. 
So strings are immutable by design, unlike character sequences, which are mutable. In the first code snippet that I have here, I defined a variable caresec variable, and I assigned it a character sequence in the next line. And in the third line, I have modified the first four characters to capital T H I S. Note that I cannot assign this caresec variable a character sequence of length different than 28. And that, that's the limitation which strings trying to handle. So strings are immutable, which means you cannot modify them once they are created. So the only option left is to assign a string type variable, a new, another string, if you want to change the value of a string type variable. Same string type variable can be assigned strings of different lengths, as you can see in this code snippet here. Now, what are the advantages of this immutability? In the second line of this code snippet, I have initialized a string and assigned it to variable one. And in the next line, I assigned the value of variable one to variable two. And after that, I have some operations re represented by three dots, which are involved, which involve variable two and which does not involve variable one. Now, what's hidden behind those three dots is something and can be anything. It can be an assignment operator on a variable two. It can be a function call on variable two, anything that you can think of. But the main thing to note is after these operations are performed, variable one is still unaffected by those operations. And this behavior is something desirable, A, because it leads to less bugs, and B, because it provides a better abstraction to a user who is dealing with strings in Fortran. So now that user can uh, consider variable one and variable two as totally different, independent of each other. And uh, this behavior is not limited to immutable data types per se. It can be expressed by muta mutable data types as well, as you will notice in the case of string list, which is a mutable data type, but still exhibit the same behavior. Now, features of the APIs that are provided. All procedures that are provided are pure in nature, which means that the, uh, they do not have any effects on data outside them, except for the input that they take in. Further, uh, we have provided elemental procedures wherever possible so that a procedure can deal with vectors and take vectors as input and return a vector as the output. With functions, we have gone one step further to, to adopt a philosophy where we believe that functions are there to return some output and they should not have any side effects on the inputs that are given to the function. Hence, so we'll notice that all the arguments of function is taking are uh, intent in nature. These procedures integrate very well with the character sequences, allocatable pointer and characters and strings. Even the code snippet that I've shown you previously where I initialized a string and then assigned it to a string type variable, well, that can be written in a more user-friendly way by directly assigning a string type variable, a character sequence, and everything will be automatically taken care of for, taken care of for you. High level APIs are capable of doing some thinking on their own, on your behalf. For example, if you take a slice API, which takes in three optional arguments, first, last, and stride. So if you don't provide an optional argument explicitly, the API will automatically figure out what that should be based on the arguments that are specified. Low level APIs are loaded with features that they really provide a good base for you so let's say when you are looking for a very specific use case and you want to use some API to do that, well, you can write a custom function of your own on the top of a low level API, or you can use a low level API in combination with other APIs that are provided in the library. And uh, if you peel off the abstraction layer, you will realize that the underlying implementation uses allocatables, which makes strings more secure and there are no chances of memory leaks. Next, I have string list with me. Uh, by string list, I mean a list of strings, where we adopted a similar philosophy, same philosophy as we did with strings. Procedures are pure, functions have intent in arguments. String list provides both backward and forward indexes. Uh, here, integers are not used as indexes. Rather, string list provides you with two functions, fidx and bidx, which the output of these functions is used as an index for string list. They take in an integer as the input and both return 
same uh, both return a data type of same type which is used as index for string list so if you are interested to know more about these i recommend checking out the documentation and if you are interested to know more about pointers and allocatables in fortran then you can check out the youtube video here thank you thank you for listening thank you very much uh, ayman uh, fantastic work so uh, we'll now move on um, to a uh, talk which is going to be given by Arkin on uh, behalf of Chatham, who uh, unfortunately cannot make the conference. Uh, and this is on uh, linked lists uh, in uh, standard library. Um, so if you uh, go ahead and share your screen, Arkin. Uh, yes, we'll do. Uh, Chatham was called back to his uh, university and is now in, in quarantine. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, really a pity that he can't, uh, can't show his work here. Um, so I'll do it in, in stairs. Um, here we go. Right. Oh, sorry. I have to confirm this. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, good. Um, well, generic linked lists. That was the idea of this uh, this part of the C C C GSOC project. Um, linked lists, uh, you probably know it uh, quite well, but they are um, one of the general uh, data structures, uh, which are very well known um, in the programming world. Um, one thing they are um, good at, um, which is not um, the, the, the 40 of, uh, of arrays, is that they can grow and shrink as you need them. Um, they have a well-established uh, API. Uh, which is actually very extensive. So we have only dealt with a, a subset of that. Um, but um, a linked list gives you access to, to data via nodes. Um, each node stores uh, one particular part of piece of data and you can move uh, uh, forward or backward even if, if uh, needs to be um, uh, from uh, node to node. And that's the whole idea of these, these uh, links. Um, for us, the goal was to have an efficient uh, implementation, uh, which would be usable with a large amount of data. Um, we we'll talk about 1 million nodes and more. Um, of course, um, smaller lists uh, are sh should also be uh, possible. Um, flexible in the sense that you can store arbitrary data, and that's actually um, easier to achieve than um, restricting your linked list to a particular type of data and have um, um, linked lists for all kinds of, uh, of data types. Um, that's the part, that's the um, drawback of Fortran not having uh, generic uh, programming uh, uh, features. But well, let's, let's focus on these arbitrary data instead. Um, and another thing is that uh, these linked lists um, are usable as a, blocking, a building block for say stacks, um, queues and priority queues associative arrays if you want, um, and a lot more uh, things. And at least the techniques behind it uh, should be able to uh, be used again in other uh, things. So one of the things we focused on was the performance. A linked list um, essentially has a sequential access. So lo lo locating an item is of the order n, uh, where n is the number of uh, elements. Um, a solution we chose for long lists, so we're talking about 1 million, 10, or even 100 million elements, um, is to use a simple hierarchical structure where you have a parent list uh, whose data are actually other uh, lists. And then um, you get a first step into uh, this parent list. And from there, you can uh, look for the right, uh, right node within that uh, child list. That made things uh, quite uh, quite a bit easier to uh, uh, to find. Um, and as an illustration, I have some um, some small uh, uh, small set of data here. To build um, uh, a list of one million nodes, we we need about uh, zero point seven seconds to traverse it a number of times. Um, um, well, 15, 16 uh, milliseconds to delete it um, one tenth of a second. Well, this is the sort of things we have been uh, looking into. Um, to give an example of how you would use that, 
here's uh, the straightforward linked list. So I fill it um, via append, uh, one of the, the functions you can use for that. Um, I fill it with a string, um, then a, uh, an integer number, and again a string. And so you can see that uh, in the same list, different types of data can be stored. Um, and to retrieve it, you have the get function. Um, what you get back is a class star, uh, so um, polymorphic uh, pointer. Um, so you have to uh, decide what kind of uh, data type is behind that. Uh, but then you can um, say print the, the, the value or do other things with it. That's a very basic um, uh, use of this. Um, to illustrate that uh, you can indeed use this as a as a building block, I made a small <coughs> sorry uh, I made a small um, example of a priority key queue where uh, items are stored in order uh, in order of their, the task uh, priority and you get them back one by one um, in that order. Um, the ordering is done in the in the queue itself. Uh, but the data structure is uh, the linked list. So I don't have to worry about how to actually store that and uh, be able to retrieve them. Um, I just need to define, um, find the right uh, location to insert them. Um, and here, a very short one uh, with two tasks. And here is how you could uh, retrieve them. Um, so the idea of a, of a queue is that um, the first uh, one uh, that comes in is the first one that gets out. So you simply uh, get the first one and remove it from the list. Uh, again, you have this uh, uh, polymorphic uh, variable, so you have to uh, decide what, uh, what to do with that. Uh, but then the whole um, infrastructure to, uh, to store things in such a list is there, and you uh, put a small layer on top of that to make it uh, useful for your purpose in this case. A priority key queue. Um, future work we uh, intend um, extend the API. One thing would be nice um, is traversing the list with a callback routine, so you don't have to program that yourself, and you can use um, the um, the structure of the linked list uh, quite uh, efficiently. Um, we have uh, opened the uh, PR for uh, for including this in the SDLib. Um, for that, we still have to do some uh, systematic test programs, um, add uh, nice performance tests so we can uh, check that, and of course, uh, use documentation, whereas now we have mainly developer documentation. Well, that concludes my, um, my presentation about Cheetan's work. Um, it was actually his first, um, uh, first exposure to Fortran, so we are quite happy that he was able to do um, all of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alvin. That was very interesting. Um, so we have uh, just a few minutes uh, to squeeze in for questions on uh, those last uh, groups, uh, that last group of talks. Uh, I can see there's uh, been quite a few discussions on the Slack, uh, but if anyone has any questions to ask directly, then uh, please do raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I have a question for Aachen on the linked list work. Uh, you talk about um, uh, focus on performance. Um, did you uh, kind of have any measure of uh, what kind of performance overhead there is with using the class star, the unlimited polymorphic variable uh, compared to kind of a, just a compile time known um, type? It's an interesting uh, um, question. I don't think we had uh, the opportunity to look into that. Um, but what we did was um, look into uh, storing uh, different uh, uh, amounts of data per node, and that seemed to be working fine. No particular um, uh, uh, diminishing of the of the performance. So that certainly would would be one of the the things we want to include in the in the performance tests for uh, SCD. Okay, thanks. Um, 